And today as we talk about this God, we're going to be doing it in the context of probably uh, a word that just by the mere saying of it causes us disturbance, despair. We are going to be focusing a lot on despair, so much so that the title of this message is The Pit of Despair. Now, despair is a lot more than just mere sadness. In fact, the dictionary defines despair as a complete absence or loss of hope. Despair comes when we have been surrounded by problems and overwhelmed so much so that all hope seems lost. There seems to be no way forward, and even deeper still, the word, the pit of despair, takes the meaning a step further by treating it as a trap. So you have despair, periods in your life where you feel hopeless, periods of your life when you say, I'm overwhelmed. And then you get caught into this pit of despair where it seems like not only do you feel overwhelmed, but there's no way out and there's no way forward. You see, we here, especially here in America, have trained ourselves to put on false faces. So much so that the the greeting, how you are doing, only really has one standard answer, right? You say how you're doing and they, they, they always respond good. I could, you could be half dead with your arms cut off lying in a ditch and somebody comes along and says how you're doing and you better be saying I'm good. And we, we've trained ourselves so much to this response that when we have somebody who says I'm not doing too well today, it's almost like we freeze and buffer a little bit. Like we don't know how to respond to that. That's not what they were supposed to say. They were supposed to say I am good. We have trained ourselves even more to say, as a Christian, we should only ever be happy. And somehow that if we're not happy, then it's our fault. In fact, that is what has made me so angry over the prosperity gospel and those who preach it. Because they tell you that God only wants you to be happy and joyful and glad. And when you're not, it's your fault. If you were to go to the Reverend Joel Olstein or the Reverend Joyce Myers and say, I'm having an issue or say, I have a loved one that just passed away. The only comfort that they would provide you is to say, well, you don't have enough faith. That person only died because you didn't pray hard enough, because you didn't care enough. I think there is no greater lie told than that. To somehow, not only do they not acknowledge your grief, but they add on to say, it's your fault you feel this way. I often think that those who preach the prosperity gospel and those who say we're only ever supposed to be happy, I often wonder, do they ever actually read the Bible? The Bible has stories over and over again of people following God's will and yet suffering terribly for it. I mean, after all, all of the disciples, by the time that, 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 that John is in, in Patmos, had been killed. Not just died, they had been martyred for their faith. What about the persecuted church all over the world? Are they somehow not faithful enough? I will tell you, they are a lot more faithful than many of us here in America. You see, despair sneaks up on us. And one of the things that hides despair is our lies. I'm good. I'll put on a false face. If I keep telling myself I'm good, maybe long enough, maybe I'll actually start to feel good. And so then, but the, but the problem becomes then despair gets to hide in our lies. And not only does it get to hide in our lies, it gets to isolate us from everyone else. Because rather than reach out to somebody or rather than pray to God about it, we just keep saying, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. If despair steals our hope, then that means it's the enemy of Christ because Christ is our blessed hope. And where Christ comes to give us hope and assurance, despair only comes to steal that which Christ has given us. The book of Hebrews in verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 13, talks about this hope that we have. Hebrews 16, or 6, beginning in verse 13. 
And you, before we get in too much into this, I have to, uh, we have to understand something. That the hope the Bible talks about is not the same thing that we think of when we think of hope today. When we think of hope today, we treat it as almost like throwing a penny into a wishing well. It's a wish. I, you know, when we say, I hope this happens, we mean, I wish this happens. Oftentimes, we'll use hope when we, when we know it's not going to happen. Like when we say, I really, really want this, but, but we know we're not going to get it. So we said, oh, I sure really hope I could have that one day. That's not how the Bible treats hope. In fact, the, both the Greek and the Hebrew words for hope is more closely related to our word for trust or our word for assurance. You see, when the Bible says have hope or when the Bible says have hope in Christ, it is not meaning that you're going to wish that Christ is Lord or you're going to wish that Christ will take care of you. It is meaning that you trust in that, that you know that. Hope becomes an essential element of our faith as Hebrews 11 would describe faith as the things hoped for or the things not yet seen. It comes from trusting and from knowing who God is. And so my subheading above, above verse 13 says God's promises brings hope. And it begins, for example, in verse 13, there was God's promise to Abraham. And since there was no greater thing to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you and multiply your descendants beyond number. And I love this phrasing, no greater thing to hope by. Nothing more binding, nothing more powerful, nothing more assuring than the name of God. And so God says, since there's no greater thing I can promise to you, I will make an oath by my name. And uh, of course today, we have the phrase, if it's not in writing, it doesn't happen or you can't trust in it. There used to be a time where a handshake was good enough. This was kind of what the Bible times, where, where you just took people at their word. In fact, their word was so powerful that to break that word was to bring about death upon oneself. For example, if you were going to make an oath or, or make a promise to somebody, the ceremony involved killing a calf and then dividing it in half. And then the two parties would walk in through the calf, out and around and back in through the calf three times. And they would say that if I don't hold up my end of the bargain, let what happened to this calf happen to us. That's what's so neat when, when Abraham has the vision of God, it's, it's only of God walking between the calves. Because God says it's an unconditional promise. Interestingly enough, if you want to know where the tradition of the bride walking down the aisle came from, it came from this idea of splitting a calf. You have both families on either side, usually the groom on one side and the, and the brides on the other. They were to represent the two sides of the body. And the wife walks down and both the husband and wife were taking an oath saying, if this, if we break our vows, let what happened to us happen to this calf. To paint the, the picture of the seriousness of marriage. So God makes this promise and in verse 15 it says, then Abraham waited patiently and he received what God had promised. But here's the issue. We're really, really good at receiving what God has promised. Not often so good at waiting for it. You know, if we were promised that we would receive blessings from God, which we are, and that could just be our unending reality. Oh man, sign me up. This is wonderful. But it's when we start waiting that becomes the issue. For me, I have always been and probably always will be what I call a man of action. I see things, I want them done, I have my own time scale, I think I have the perfect timing. And then God comes along and says, my time's different than your time. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I have to grit my teeth and say, yes God, your time is best. But in the back of my mind, still thinking, my time is best. And so we have to wait. And waiting is when despair can start to sink in. Especially if we've been waiting a really, really long time. Because the problem becomes is we're not told how long we have to wait to be delivered. You know, if you were going to have the worst time of your life, but God told you it's only going to last two weeks and then you'll recover. And then everything will go good. You'd say, that's not too bad. I can, I, I can do that for two weeks. But we're not often given that time. We're not told how long sometimes our suffering will last. And each day, if it lasts forever, and each day it continues on and on and on, we might get a little bit closer to despair. And a little bit further from wondering, God, what are you doing? There's a story of a woman who swam the English Channel. We'll try to. 
I'm not sure whether she was starting in France or going to England or vice versa. But the English Channel is that, that it's not, I mean, it's not small, but compared to the ocean, a relatively small channel between England and France. This woman wanted to swim the whole thing. It was a very foggy day. She couldn't see the way forward, so she just kept swimming, just kept swimming. It was good for a really, really long time, but towards the end, she started to get tired. Towards the end, she started to get hopeless. There was, there was no way she could make it, and she gave in to despair. Finally, she signaled to the boat, said, I can't do it, come and get me. And I think that, by the, I'm not quite sure, but I think by the time they found her, she was about a mile from where she, where she was supposed to be. One mile left after swimming almost the whole thing. If she had known she was only a mile away, I promise you she probably would have stuck it out to the end. And you see, that's the problem with despair, is despair causes these blocks in our mind that we can't see the way forward. And despair is so inviting that it causes us to focus only on our problems instead of looking up to God, the one who will deliver us. And so we wait. And in verse 16, it continues, Now when people take an oath, they call on something greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, the oath is binding. God has also bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Now you might think, well, this is just a comforting verse, which it is. We have to understand something. The idea of a God not changing his mind was totally foreign to the people of this time. All they knew was gods who constantly and frequently changed their minds. If you were to look at the, through, the, through the Greeks and the Romans and through their, their stories about the gods, one day the gods are happy, everyone's blessed. The next day they get upset, they wipe out whole towns. But the Bible says our God doesn't change. Not only that, it says, so God has given us both his oath and his promise in verse 18. And these two things are unchanging because it is impossible for God to lie. That means we can trust what he says. We can trust what he tells us, not only about our situations, but about our eternity and about the blood of Jesus and about our sins being forgiven and about us being restored. Because it is impossible for God to lie. In fact, Numbers tells us that lies are of men. In fact, God says, I am not man. I do not lie. Implying that that's what we do, but not God. And it says... Therefore, we who have fled to him and take refuge in him can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our soul. And it leads us through, God's, through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Christ has already gone there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And then that, is, that order of Melchizedek is talked about in Hebrews 7. But the Bible says that this hope in Christ, this hope in God is a trustworthy anchor for our soul. You can think of this in the context of a, of, of a ship as it, you know, talks of an anchor. You know, the ship maybe is caught in a big whirlwind and there's a big hurricane coming. That hurricane's despair and the anchor for our hope in that is in Christ is that anchor that's holding us. Even though the waves and the winds are pulling us towards this pit of despair, God's anchor secures us. So my question then would be, what is our hope in? What do you hope in? What do you have trust in? Is it God? Is it his word? Or is it the ways of man? Is it maybe your job or your finances or this world or other people? The Bible says to put our hope in mankind is to bring about disappointment. And I promise you that if our hope is in anything else but God and his word, we will eventually fall into despair because the other things can only take us so far. So we know this, we read this, and we believe this. But it gets really, really hard to hold on to it when we're in trouble. It's easy when things are going well to believe these promises. And then when we're in trouble, we might still believe them, but it is a lot harder to see them. It is a lot harder to hold on to them. You see, what happens when we're in trouble and we don't feel God? What happens when we're in trouble and we wonder, where is God in this? You see, despair puts blinders on our eyes and makes us feel all alone, even though God is right there calling to us. 
It makes us feel as if we cannot be seen or heard. That if we were to scream and shout out that nobody would hear us because despair would drown it out. Martha feels this way when her brother Lazarus dies in John 11 verse 21. Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus saying, my brother Lazarus is dying, come and be with him. Because they knew Jesus was a healer. They knew Jesus was, was the Messiah. They knew that he had great power. They've seen him do miracles and they wanted one done for their brother. Of course, Jesus became delayed. He helped somebody else and, and got caught. And, and by the time that he got there, Lazarus had passed away. And so he shows up, and in John 11, verse 21, Martha utters the words. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. As if to say, where were you when I needed you? I called to you, I prayed to you, we could say today. I asked you to help, I asked you to deliver, I asked you to remove this, I asked you to be there, and where were you when I needed you? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, these problems would not have happened. If you had shown up, I would have been okay. Where were you? Even though the Bible tells us over and over again, that God is never leaving us nor forsaking us. Sometimes it's just hard to see that. Think of Peter when he was called out of the boat and into the water. He began walking to Jesus and Jesus called him out and said, come out here and walk towards me. And he just took his eyes off of Jesus for just a second. Started focusing on the waves and the wind and all the things crashing around him. And he began to drown and he cried out, save me, Lord. Even though Jesus was right there, he couldn't see him because he was focusing on his problems. Martha, who had faith in Jesus and still had faith even after she uttered those words, could not help but think, Jesus, where are you? Job, who had probably suffered more than any of us, reveals that sometimes our mind is the greatest enemy when it comes to things like this. In Job 3, Beginning in verse 25, he says, What I have always feared has happened to me. What I have dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest. Only troubles come. This implies that Job's thoughts were sometimes dominated by his fears and his worries. Job was a very wealthy man, had about everything you could ask for. And he probably feared losing all of that. And so when it finally happened, he said, oh, it happened. What I've always feared has finally come to pass. Because he spent time. Now, that's not why it happened. Obviously, Satan was testing him. But he had built it up in his head over and over again, probably playing the scenarios over and over again. And he says, it's finally happened. You see, sometimes when we're in despair or near it, our mind builds our problems up so much greater than they actually are. And it causes us to focus on them over and over again. To repeat them like a record over and over again. To build them up in our minds. Until we get to the point where what we're thinking is going to happen. Is going to be so much worse than what actually happens. But we spend time focusing on them. And that's the way our problems work. They work to attract our attention. They, you know, Satan knows exactly what he's doing. If he can keep us focused on our problems. Then it's really hard to be praising God. So when we are nearing despair or when we have troubles or trials, the Bible gives us two options. We can turn from God, blame him for everything, or maybe not even go that far. But I have heard so many people say, I'm so disturbed, I just can't even pray right now. And I understand that emotion, and I, 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 I'm not blaming them for that emotion, but I do believe that Satan at work in their lives. I know that Satan at work in their lives. To keep us so disturbed, to keep us so, so, so closed off that we won't even pray to God because we just don't feel it. Job, again, going through all his problems, his wife gave him the solution of, of Job 2 verse 9. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. And then she leaves him. So there's option one then. To blame God, to throw it all on God. And then Job answers her, but Job replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. 
Should, I only, should we only accept good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. You see, my problem with, with the argument that, that bad things disprove God's, and I've heard many, many atheists and agnostics make this argument, how can we believe in a God when there's famine, when there's suffering, when there's death, when children die, when there's starvation, when there's warfare, when there's sickness, and they, they get offended? How can you possibly believe in a God when you see all this stuff? And I want to shake them and say, why, is all the, why do all the bad things disprove God, but none of the good things prove him? Why is it that we can stand up and say, oh, because there's war in the world, there must be no God. But for some reason, if we say, look at all the goodness, the fact that the sun is shining, the fact that we have life, why doesn't that point to a God? You see, our, our, our problems can sometimes take our focus off of God. Because we like the idea of a God who's only there to bless us. We like the idea of a God who is a genie for us. Who we can rub his lamp and say, give me this. And he gives you that. Then you put him back in the lamp. Put him back up on the shelf and live your life. Option two then is to lean in closer to God. When troubles come, oftentimes we, we, we get so disturbed that we pull away from God. But really, when troubles come, we ought to increase our faith even more. We ought to get even closer to God. If you're going through troubles, pray even more than you have before. Get even closer to him than you have before. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8, he says, we are pressed on every side with troubles. Again, I, I understand something. Paul, who is, who is the titan of our faith, the apostle to the Gentiles, and here he is, a life of troubles. He said, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. He says, we are perplexed, or the, the Greek there is, is overwhelmed, and I like that word better. We are overwhelmed. And maybe some of you can say, that's me. I am overwhelmed. I just can't do it anymore. He says, we are overwhelmed, but not driven to despair. He says, we are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We are knocked down, but not destroyed through the suffering of our bodies. Though the suffering of our bodies continue to, sh no, excuse me. Though suffering, our bodies continue through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may be seen in our bodies. And this, this, this phrase is, is actually really kind of moving because Paul is saying our troubles serve as a way for us to share in the suffering like Jesus. I have read many testimonies of the persecuted church, people who face death for their faith, people who, who face death all the time. And one of the overwhelming testimonies they give is they say, I praise God. Not just I praise God for his goodness. They say, I praise God that he would count me worthy of suffering like his son. That baffles me. Not just to say I praise the God of goodness, or not just to say I praise God for the goodness, but to say I praise God for the suffering that I'm, in, that I'm involved in. I praise God that my body is suffering because he has counted me worthy to suffer like Jesus. These are people who keep their eyes on God. And that's all well and good, and we can create many, many beautiful sermons around this idea of just looking to God over our problems. But the fact still remains, what do we do when we're in our problems? What do we do when we just don't feel it? And I think that's where Psalm 42 comes in. Psalm 42 has many names, given many titles. I would like to add my own, The Cure for Despair. Psalm 42 verse 1 begins, as a deer pants for streams of water, so I pant for you, O oh God. Now for, for a deer to pant, that, that, especially the, the Hebrew here, means and denotes some kind of distress. They pant, they're thirsty because they burn a lot of energy, which usually means that they have been chased by something, or being chased by something, or being overwhelmed by something, or being attacked by something. And so in that moment, because of the, all the energy that is expended, and think of just all the energy we expend on our problems. 
uh, the psalmist says, the deer pants for water. He says, but I pant for you. So as a deer runs for water, as it runs from an enemy, the writer is saying he won't rest until he has restored a relationship with God. That he won't rest until he sees the goodness of God. It says in verse 2, I thirst for God, the living God. Again, a name that separates him from all other useless and worthless gods. All other idols that the Bible says are made of mere wood, metal, bronze, copper. And says they can do nothing. He says, when can I go stand before him? Uh, the Hebrew actually doesn't have the, the word before here. Um, the Hebrew is his presence. When can, I, when can I go stand face to face? We, the, the translations have translated it to before, but the actual Hebrew just reads, when can I stand in his face? Or when can I stand to see his face? Implying that if, if God brought up something in the, in the life of the psalmist saying, this is in my, this is in my way, Give this up, give this up, give this up. He, he would gladly give it up because his number one priority is standing in the presence of God. So I guess my question then becomes is what do you thirst for? Do you thirst for God? Do you desire him? Do you desire to read your word or to pray? Is he the thing that you crave is he your thought when you get up? Is he, your, is he your thoughts before you go to bed? Or is he just merely the deity you come to hear about on Sunday? Is he just merely the, the God that, that you, you come to get entertained for about an hour or an hour and a half? Is he the one that you desire above all else? Or is he just your genie you want during the bad time so that he can help you? Is Christianity your identity in your life or is it merely the religion you practice on Sunday? If everything else was taken from your life and God forbid, would you still be okay because you had God? There are people all over the world that have everything stripped from them, but they praise God each and every day because the God is, this is that's the one thing I can't live without. Could you live without everything else if God said, give it up, I need you to surrender this to me? Or is there things you want to hold back and say, whoa, don't meddle, God. This is my life. The psalmist says, I thirst for him. He says, day and night, I have only tears for food while my enemies continually taunt me saying, where is this God of yours? So this idea of tears for food or tears for bread means that it, it denotes an even greater thirst because tears being salt water, it doesn't satisfy. He says, I have nothing. And all my enemies surround me, their only words are, where is your God? You see, like it or not, when we turn our lives over to Christ, people are going to be watching us. Not only are they going to be watching us, but they're going to be watching us, especially in the bad times. They want to see what we'll do when the cards are down. How we'll react when things don't go our way. And I promise you, they only want to watch because they want to see us fail. Where is your God? The psalmist continues on, says, my heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walk among the crowds of worshipers, leading great processions to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sounds of great celebration. The psalmist is saying, my life used to be so good. He's telling you about a time in his life where he just felt the presence of God so strong, where he served him, where he led others in worship of him. And he's just saying, but now I don't feel that. He says, I used to, but now it's as if gone. And he's, he said, now at the point, he's, he's asking the question, why am I so discouraged? In verse 5, why is my heart so sad? As if he's remembering all the good times. And he says, why can't it be like that again? You see, in despair, the good times only serve as, as pain to us. Because it reminds us of how things used to be instead of how things are now. And so he utters those words that he says, I am sad. I don't know why. I'm in despair. I don't understand it. But then he says, I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. First thing he does is he acknowledges his feelings. He doesn't try to deny them. He doesn't say all is well. There's no point in that. Speak it. I'm in despair. I am overwhelmed. 
but then he pushes it aside. You see, if this was a Greek or a Roman document, you would have a great long ballad of his troubles. Oh, my grief is as high as the mountain. Oh, it's as low as the sea. Oh, poor me, I am stricken. But the psalmist focuses only a minute on it. He says, I feel this way. And then he pushes it aside and said, I'm going to praise you. He says, I'm going to keep my focus on you. And my question then becomes, is when we have problems, are we praying to God? Are we seeking God? Or are we just sitting around saying, poor me, poor me? Because one will serve only to exacerbate the problem, the poor me. And the other will help get us through it. But that doesn't mean it's going to take it all away. Because he then acknowledges, now I am deeply discouraged. So he says, I'll praise you. But he says, I'm still deeply discouraged. He says, but I will remember you even from the distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan, and from the distant land of Mazar. Mount Hermon was the site where the king Shion of the Amorites was killed and King Og of Bashan was killed. So, and, and, and Mount Mazar is near Mount Sinai where the law was given and is most likely the site of the transfiguration. And so what the psalmist is saying, the psalmist is saying, yes, I'm discouraged. But he's saying, once again, I'll remember what you've done for me. I'll remember the past where you've delivered me. I'll remember how you've watched over me. And he says, that will bring me comfort. He says, I hear the turmoil of the raging sea as waves and surging tides sweep over me. As your waves and surging tides sweep over me. The psalmist makes a point of saying your waves. Now, many have read this and have said that means that God's the one causing this, that God's the one sending this. Now, I don't deny that sometimes God sends problems or issues our way so that we'll turn to him. But it, for me, that does, just doesn't fit in this context. More likely than not, when he says your waves or your tides, he is saying, God, you are God of everything. It's almost as if he's saying, if these are yours, then why are they still after me? Couldn't you stop them with a the snap of your fingers? Couldn't you take them away? And of course, the answer is yes. But then he moves back then in verse 8 to say, But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing his songs, praying to the God who gives life. He moves on and says, I will praise you. I will pray to you. Even though it shows no signs of him being delivered right then and there. In fact, he, he continues on in his despair in verse 10. Oh God, my rock hour. Verse 9. Oh God, my rock. I cry. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones and again they scoff. Where is this God of yours? You see, if people keep repeating it long enough, they hope maybe one day you'll start to question that. Maybe if your problems last long enough, you'll start to wonder, where are you, God? Maybe you'll utter the words like the psalmist that I cry to you. I take refuge in you. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around? As if to say, do you see me? Do you see what I'm going through? Do you notice me? Of course, sometimes it doesn't feel as if he does. But then we remember the words of Haggai in Genesis. Haggai, who was Abra or Sarah's maidservant given to Abraham to have a kid with, was being tormented by Sarah, so she ran away. Now, Haggai at this time is a servant, a slave, so she has no standing in society. She has treated nothing as nothing more than property. She has, and you want to talk about somebody not seeing you, that would be her. She could be brutally, brutally beaten up, even raped, have all of her things stolen from her. And there could be nobody she could cry to who would even care. She could go to the official. She should go to her master. But she has no right to speak out against somebody else because she's not even considered a person, just property. But in the midst of this, God shows up and says, I know what you're going through says, I will be with you and I will comfort you. This person who was abandoned by society, not seen by anyone. And yet after that day, she names God Elroy, the God who sees me. The God who sees me. The psalmist ends by saying again, why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? The very same words that were repeated in verse 5 are restated here. 
And there have been many books written about why these words are the same. I, I think it is simply just because the psalmist is saying, I still feel bad. The psalmist is saying, I have, I have looked to God. I have seen him. I am seeing all of his goodness. But I still feel sad. It's almost as if he's making an acknowledgement that just because we follow after God, it doesn't mean things are going to be easy. Just because we have the joy of the Lord doesn't mean we're always going to be happy. But again, he then turns and says, I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. As if to say, yes, these problems are still there. They're still present. But again, I'm not going to focus on them. Because I will put my hope in God. You see, he wasn't just a fair weather follower of Jesus. Or um, of God at this time, but, but uh, for our purposes, Jesus. He wasn't just somebody there for the good times. He was there for the bad times as well. And the Bible tells us that the Lord will always be with us. The Bible tells us that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And it makes only one qualifying mark. If you want God to be with you through the bad times, you better be with him through the good. If you want him to be Lord of your life when everything comes crashing around you, you better be serving him when things are well. God is not your band-aid and he is not your genie. He is the living God who must be worshipped. Who must have first place in your heart. Which I think is why the psalmist says, I thirst for you. He is saying, you have that first place. And that doesn't mean we're always going to have an easy life. That means that sometimes we'll have problems. But for each of those problems, we can turn and focus on God. Not focusing on our situation, but focusing on the one who saves us. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, there are times where we can utter the words of Paul that we are surrounded, that we are overwhelmed, we are chased, we are hunted down. But remind us also of the words where Paul says, but we are not overcome. But we are not driven to despair. Lord, get our attention off of our problems and onto you. For those who are burdened here today, Lord, let them cast that burden upon you. As your word says, let us exchange our heavy burden for your light burden. And Lord, if you would deliver us from our problems, we would praise you. But Lord, if you choose to deliver us through our problems, we still praise you. It is in your holy son's name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.